All right, hey everyone, I'm Kevin Curtin. Welcome to Curtin Call. I'm here today with a very special guest. This man sitting next to me is a Grammy Award winner. He's a producer, songwriter, and has written and co-written some of the greatest songs of all time. It's an honor to be here with him today. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the legendary Daryl Simmons. Daryl? There you go, man. Thank you for being on the show. Appreciate yeah, it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate hey, my pleasure. Thank my you pleasure. So, so thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. So let's get right into this. You know, if you could take me back to growing up in Indianapolis, Indiana, you know, I understand you started playing drums around nine and eventually you got into piano. So I'm wondering, growing up, you know, what, what kind of groups were inspiring you? What music was inspiring you? And, and of course, what songwriters and producers were kind of inspiring you back then that eventually led to you doing what you did? Uh, probably. Uh, started playing drums and, you know, influenced a lot by Stevie Wonder, Earth, Wind & Fire. Earth, Wind & Fire was a big influence for me once I saw what they were doing. And I grew up being in bands and here was, well, here was this big band with nine people, you know, writing songs, producing. I was like, wow, how is this dude, Maurice White, putting all this together? So if anybody had a big influence on me, it was Maurice White. Uh, and I got a chance to meet him as really? a kid. Kenny and I met him. I think I was maybe 15, and Kenny was 14 or 16, some very young age sure. that came through our town, got a chance to meet him and speak with him, and that was kind of a really big highlight. That's incredible. Young kid. That's <laughs> yeah, incredible. Absolutely. Well, what period of time was that, like around maybe what album? Five, it was their Open Our Eyes album, Okay, actually. That's a great yeah. album. Yeah, I think Mighty Mighty, Open Our Eyes. I think Devotion may have been on Oh, that. Love Devotion. Yeah, that was yeah. one of the songs we copycatted in our band and sure. covered. Sure. So yeah, big influence uh, for myself back then. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah. eventually you, you, obviously you meet Kenny, right? Yeah. In, in high school, right? Yeah, high school. Yeah. So how did how did you guys connect and what do you remember about those early days of writing music together? Uh, actually, I was in a band with his brother. He had an older brother named sure. Michael Edmonds and Michael played guitar in a band that I was in with some guys. We just played instrumentals. We didn't have a singer. Hmm. And I used to hear about Kenny, that he could sing. And I'd say, hey man, why don't we get your brother? No, no, we don't need him. We don't need him. <laughs> I'm like, why is he like not wanting to get his brother? We don't need anybody to sing. And I heard hmm. that Kenny could sing. Long story short, I eventually end up bumping into Kenny and another guy after we had rehearsed. And I said, hey, I heard about you, your brother, blah, blah, blah. And, and so we stood there talking, me, him, a guy named Emmanuel Officer, who ended up being a, a really great writer as well. And he said, hey, well, you should join our band. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, so I joined his band playing drums and uh, then kind of discovered that he was writing songs and I aspired to write songs. So we just kind of hit it off. And 50 years later, we're still our best buds. So Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. What, what do you remember about those early days, though, just, you know, kind of? Yeah, put the pen to paper and just, just wanting to write songs. I mean, we just had this as kid, teenagers. We both were very similar. Yeah. He's born April 10th, I'm born April 11th. Mm. We're a year apart, a lot of similarities, uh, likes, dislikes, and you know, both pretty much shy. He's probably was more shy than I was. Both introverted. Introverted in school, didn't have the 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 whole the whole Mac Daddy thing to go talk to girls, but we discovered that if we could write it down and sing it to them, oh, it would melt their hearts. We're like, hmm, this is kind of cool. <laughs> sure. So we actually got to a point where we would write songs and put a girl's name in it, take the same song, put another girl's name in it. <laughs> you know, we wrote the song about you. It was like the same sure. song, we put another girl's <laughs> name in it. So we'd go to these bonfires sure. and Kenny would bring the guitar. You know, they were like, oh, these guys are amazing. They wrote this song, it's got my name in it. But sure. a week ago, we had another girl that had their, her, song, her name sure. in it. Sure. So we just discovered that it was a very powerful thing to be able to write it down and mm -hmm. deliver it that way, as opposed to, I couldn't talk to girls, man. I was scared. Sure. I was like, like the girl, but I would never say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, he was pretty much the same way. So we had that same kind of similarity going. And so, I don't know, we just, were, you know, developed a knack of knowing what to say or mm -hmm. knowing what, you know, girls wanted to hear. You know, I remember doing an interview once and said, well, you guys write all these female songs. How did you... I think it came from childhood in high school of what we wanted to say, yeah. but couldn't say it. So we put it, you know, with the pen, the paper. With the pen with Tony songs or Superwoman with Karen and, mm -hmm. you know, coming up with this lyric for a woman. It's like, well, we kind of were in this position, so we know what they're feeling. We think. It's amazing. So yeah. let's put it in a, in a, in a song. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the way, with drums, um, can you take me back to like, 
Were you playing by ear? Were you, were, were you reading music? music? Like, no, there was a guy down the street named Bill Cox who played in a band okay. with Kenny's brother, yeah. Melvin Edmonds, who eventually was yes. in After, after seven. 7. yeah. And Bill would set up his drums in the garage and I would hear him playing. I'd ride my bike. He was an older guy, of course. And I'd sit in the drive at the edge of the driveway and he'd be up there in the garage. I was like, wow. Then one day he says, hey, why don't you come up? And then I got up there and he started kind of showing me some stuff. Mm. And I just fell in love with the drums. And I ended up, I don't know if it was that year, maybe a year later, got a, a drum set from J.C. Penney. Really? Yeah, three pieces. Remember what set. color it was? Blue. Nice. And Bill came down, set it up and, you know, got me going on it and yeah. um, I practiced a lot. I practiced, but Kenny got me off the drums because <laughs> he says, well, you have a big Afro like the Jackson five do. So you don't need to be on the drums. You need to be standing out front. Mm -hmm. I'm going, I'm not going to stand out front. I'd be terrified. Mm -hmm. So I borrowed this guy's Kunga drum to hide in front of and basically went out front to sing and eventually became a really good percussionist. I ended up Mm -hmm. practicing and really studying it and actually playing percussion on some of the records that we did mm -hmm. and uh, played a little percussion with the D. I played keyboards and percussion, played, you know. So how did, how did piano come into play? Because eventually you, you get piano. Because I couldn't write songs on the drums. Interesting. So I said, okay. So I tried guitar and I felt my fingers were too fat. So I was at a mall one day, went in a music store and was tinkering on this piano. I go, oh, my fingers fit on the keys. I said, this is cool. So I actually put the piano in layaway back then. If you, I'm old school. So if you know what layaway is, I do. you I go do. pay on it every yeah. month or whatever. So I pay on this Baldwin Acrosonic, I'll never forget it, upright piano. And so eventually they're gonna deliver it. So this truck pulls up and Kenny was at my, at my house because I told him I had bought this piano, it's mm -hmm. coming. My mom's like, what are you gonna do with that? I go, <laughs> I'm gonna put it in the living room and write songs. She goes, no, you're not. And I'm like, well, where can I put it? She said, you can put it in the den. And Kenny and I pushed this piano through the front yard, around the side of the house, to the den sliding doors and got it into the den. Hmm. And that was my start of tinkering on the piano to, to write songs. And wow. that's, how that, that's how that happened. Because I said, I can't, well, drums don't have any, they have notes, but you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. You know, and so once that started and, you know, Kenny would play and, you know, he would just take the chords from the guitar and, and bur you know, convert them to the piano. And mm -hmm. that's pretty much how it started, you know, never For stopped. you, was it was it always the pen to the paper first and then the music or music first and then pen always to music paper? first, always music, always first. music first. And mm -hmm. I always say there's no right or wrong way to write, mm -hmm. uh, but. For, for us, it was, what is the music telling us? What is this music saying? You know, cause you know, Kenny to me is the master of melody. He always comes up with this great melody. He said, if the melody's catchy, he said, all we gotta do is fill in the blanks. Mm. And I was always good at filling in the blanks. Once he had that melody laid, they go, what's, what's the melody saying? It's like, what's it saying? What's it saying? It's saying, can we talk? Can we, can we talk for a minute? You know, then we, you know, once that melody was there, yeah, yeah, you developed it. Well, what's the melody was? But the melody was established and you knew it was a hit melody. Mm. Kenny would always say, all I got to do is think of the right words. I go, yeah, damn, what's it saying? Can we talk for a minute? Girl, I want to know your name. Yeah, yeah. Can we talk? Then yeah. it's like, okay, what's the story? What are we saying? Can we talk was easy because that was us. That yeah. was us in high school. Mm -hmm. We were shy. We, we you know, hey. Last night I, sure. I saw you standing. I was going to ask you, and well, yeah. I want to get back to that later because yeah. that was one of my questions about Can We Talk. But in general, like when you finished a song, when either you finished the song or you both finished the song, mm -hmm. however it kind of happened, was all that kind of laid down on a on a demo? You know, before. Oh, so, oh, like, in, in other words, like that. once you, while you were kind of coming up with all the words, were oh, you yeah. kind of singing it and then putting it? Can you put it down? Can you would always sing it? As, okay, let's put it down. Got it. Play okay. and I'd sing the background part. Mm -hmm. Kenny would sing the lead, or when we got to the hook, we'd both sing the hook. And it'd be like very quick, okay, that's cool. That's good enough. Got it. So anything that we did, he would put it down. 
we are we, we would sing it ourselves mm -hmm. hey we'd leave go have lunch come back let's see if it feels good let's let's see if it still feels like a hit mm -hmm. like, yeah and then kenny would say can you remember it without even playing it so yeah. okay sing it okay sing the hook and if we couldn't sing it like uh, i don't know but if we could go right right to it and sing it hey like okay i mean i think we got one mm -hmm. and then kenny would put it down very rough nothing elaborate at all just enough to know how it goes you know and eventually sometimes we'll go give it to tony right hey, here here it is go learn it here johnny gill hey here it is go learn it Karen, sure. here it is go learn it mm -hmm. sing it like kenny sang it you know what i mean so that was always the the format the format of of the way that we wrote like i said there's no right or wrong way yeah then you got elton john and bernie Taupin, mm -hmm. who are the opposite bernie goes hey these lyrics need music right i'm like jesus how do you do that yeah, I don't know how I would do it that way either. Yeah. To me, that, I, I work with That's them. hard. I work That's with hard, yeah. And I said, how did you guys do that? Because how do you... What did he say? Yeah. He said, I just look at it. She said, I look at it. And like me, what is it saying? You know what I mean? But to me, it's still, the, it's the hardest. <laughs> how do you look at yeah. the words and go, dun, 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 dun. So how do you come up with that rhythm and then the melody mm -hmm. to Benny and the Jets or Candle in the Wind or Yellow Brick Road? Yeah. That just seems so hard to me. But that was their yeah. formula. And that, of course, it worked for them. But that's harder to me because just looking at words, mm. I don't get a melody or rhythm from looking at words. It's just like, oh, these are nice words. But it doesn't move me enough to go, oh, I hear. So to me, I think that's the greatest thing that they done, that they done, that they did, you know, Elton and Bernie's amazing. Mm, absolutely. Take me back if you can to Manchild, because you were talking a little bit about, you know, back in the day, if you could take me back to how that group got started and also, you know, to that original debut, 1977 album, Power and Love. Uh, actually, you know, uh, it was a band that was already formed. Some guys that were a little older than Kenny and I that had played in clubs and we, Reggie Griffin, who was the leader of that band, great musician, mm. had a brother named Rayford Griffin who played drums. He's the reason I stopped playing drums when I saw him play drums. He was, he was a real drummer, <laughs> you know? And actually he, Kenny and I played in a band together and they recruited Kenny to come mm. join their band, the club band. And so Kenny left our group, went to the, to the group Manchild. And then eventually I came along later. Mm -hmm. And uh, from my understanding, from our ex-managers, probably three guys that didn't want me in the group, they voted and I guess they voted me in, but you know, some of the other guys didn't want me in band. So it was a good club band playing six nights a week, making a little bit of money. They had already recorded some songs before they had recording experience mm. that Kenny and I didn't have. And then eventually, you know, the band got a record deal and mm -hmm. did those two albums, which I learned a lot. That was really a good learning ground for me, uh, being around Reggie because he was already into recording. He played three instruments. He was a master at saxophone, guitar, and keyboards, and recording. He had a big task cam, reel to reel. Mm -hmm. And we'd get to rehearsal, and he'd be have written this song. And I'm just sitting there going, damn, how did, he, how did he do that? How did he play all the instruments? How did he put all that together? I mean, he was doing what Prince was doing. Really? But he just didn't, it didn't happen. You know, in the way that it happened, of course, for Prince. But a talented but, cat, yeah. Very talented mm -hmm. to this day. Like, Probably after Maurice White, mm -hmm. probably uh, the most influential person was wow. a musician, you know, of, of playing music and recording mm -hmm. and rhythm and all that stuff. I learned a lot from Reggie during mm -hmm. those years of just watching, yeah. just watching him do what he did and later applying that to when Kenny and I started recording, you know, mm -hmm. and laying it out on the console. This is what we're going to start with. We're going to put this here. So uh, very, very influential person. Uh, that I look up to, still look up to him today. Yeah, yeah. So eventually the group breaks up, right? You transition to some other things and eventually you, you start working on some of the deal stuff, right? In right. terms of writing and also playing on some of those songs, yes, right? absolutely. So take me back to to working with the deal. What what was that whole environment like? You got Figs, you got um, LA, right? right? Well, the deal was a band that was also in existence when we were... Yeah. Manchild. It was The Deal, Manchild, another group you may remember called Midnight Star. Yes. They were all from Cincinnati. Indianapolis was only 105 miles. So they were coming to Indianapolis playing in the clubs. We weren't going to Cincinnati. They mm -hmm. were coming to Indianapolis to play in the clubs. So that's how we met Bo Watson and Melvin. 
Rachel Calloway, because they would come and play. The deal would come and play. We met L.A. and D. and Carlos. Just kind of like we met these guys, you know. Years later, uh, after Kenny left Manchild, he went to another band up in Michigan. And I continued with the band, uh, just kind of not really knowing what I was doing. Mm. And Kenny said, hey, you know, I've been going to Cincinnati, working with Bo, Bo Watson at Midnight Star, and uh, uh, this group, The Deal. I've been kind of working on some of their recordings. And so Kenny had written a, co-written a song with Bo called Slow Jam. Great song. Great song. Great it song. hit Kenny's first gold album. I was so excited for Kenny. And he came into town and said, hey, well, The Deal wants me to work with them. And then eventually he said, they want me to join the band. He says, hey, would you like to come along, play as a side musician and write songs? I'm like, pew, I'm out of there, you know? Sure. So I left, went to Cincinnati, started writing with those guys. And mm -hmm. then eventually uh, their album came out. I was not a member, but I was mm -hmm. a musician. Sure. Got a tour with Luther and DeBarge. Probably How tour. was that? Oh, it was fun. It was probably the funnest time of my life. Just wow. not a care in the, where, in the world. Talk about talent. Just, oh my God. Just, just hanging out, writing songs, riding on the tour bus in a duffel bag, no responsibilities, <laughs> no kids, no wives, no girls, just doing these sure. every sure. day. Just doing what you love. Doing what we love. Just And that was probably, yeah. it was probably the funnest period from 83 to probably 86 or 7 while we yeah. were doing that stuff. And then, you know, we come off the road, uh, Kenny, L.A. and I started writing songs. Yeah. And that, of course, was what we wanted to do, and they eventually kind of get it going. You know, yes. say, hey, let's just stay out here in Los Angeles and see if we can make something happen. Mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I'm down for that. You know, I'm not going back to Indianapolis, <laughs> you know. <laughs> sure. And so one thing led to another, and, you know, they had written a song called Rock Steady. And for the Whispers, For right? the Whispers. And I wrote a song called In the Mood, which mm -hmm. was a ballad. Great song. And I had gone back to Cincinnati. And Kenny calls and says, hey, um, something's getting ready to happen. He said, you need to get back out here. And I go, really? He goes, yeah, with me, LA and I just produced this song and wrote Rock Steady. I said, yeah, I heard it. It's a great mm -hmm. song because I wasn't a part of that. He said, but they want to record your song in the mood. I'm like, what? Go, yeah, remember that song? Yeah. He said, I kind of fixed it up. Mm -hmm. Kenny's a master at doing that. You know, you had an idea. He could, you know, he could put his magic on it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so we're going to send you a ticket. You need to get back out here. And as soon as I got back out there, man, it was like, it was a whirlwind of, I can't even explain it. It was just so busy. It was so busy. I was sleeping in the room where we kept the equipment, where we worked on the mm -hmm. floor. And hey, uh, this guy named James Ingram's coming by tomorrow. Listen to some songs. I'm going, okay. I wow. wake up. Hey, this girl, Paula. From Switch, right? James Ingram? No, James Ingram, the singer James Ingram. Oh, okay, uh, okay. That's his guy. Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yes. And uh, hey, this little girl named Paula Abdul is coming by. She's going to hear some songs. We're going to play Knocked Out for her. Yeah. It's like, okay, hey, this guy Johnny Gill is coming by to hear some songs. It was just like every day, somebody was coming by our apartment mm. to listen to our songs. Johnny Gill, Karen mm -hmm. Knight. Uh, and it just started to, <laughs> you know what I mean? To snowball into this crazy thing where we were working like it was like a factory man it was yeah it was that i don't really know how we did all the work how we did but we had a tag team Did you sleep at all back then or not much not much not much at all i mean because once it started they'd be at the studio i'd be home working on lyrics yeah they sent me with paula to do vocals they were over here with pebbles yeah hey go down here with these little boys and even on low sleep you'd be able to oh yeah we yeah, function we'd function oh yeah, that's how we we up to, you know stay up till five six up wow. the next day okay what we got going today hey you need to go down to the silver lake with the boys and do die my heart you know kenny and i are going to go over here with sheena easton and do you know the lover in me mm -hmm. okay cool and it was just rotating you know yeah. i'd stay at the house work on lyrics or i'd go produce mm -hmm. they'd go produce kenny and i would stay at the house la would go produce and it was just that once somebody asked us once, like, how are you guys doing all this? You know, we were yeah, like, right. they thought I was a ghostwriter. Sure. D. Simmons, they thought was a ghostwriter. Mm. They didn't even know I was a real person. That's how I got my name, Silent Partner. Silent Partner. Because yeah. somebody said, oh, so you're the Silent Partner. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I guess I am. That's a cool name. I think I'll take it. <laughs> so I became the Silent Partner because sure. they were the producers and they got yeah. all the publicity like they should. Yeah. And I was at home writing or at the studio recording and doing what they had me to do. Sure. And so it was a, it was really, a, but it was so much fun because it was just, it was just a music factory, man. It was so much fun. And I still don't know how we did it to this day with no auto tune. 
Yeah, and exactly. Somebody asked me in an interview, said, well, if you didn't have auto tune, what did you do? I said, <laughs> we used real singers. We, that good thing. And we told them to <laughs> right. come back tomorrow. <laughs> come back tomorrow. Well, yeah. That was it. Well, we'll right. see you tomorrow because it ain't happening today and we right. can't fix it. Yeah. And that's that's what that was yeah. our auto tune was. We kept right. hammering it until we got it. So nah, it's not quite sounds okay, Tommy, but I see you tomorrow. It's like, really? I go, Yeah, see you tomorrow. Come back tomorrow. Yeah. Do Bingo. it again. Do it yep. again. Yeah, but yep. it was it was the funnest time to me. It was the most fun because there were really no barriers. Mm. It was music twenty four seven, and uh, we had this friendly camaraderie with Jimmy and Terry and oh, Teddy. Yeah. Oh, what are they doing? What did they do? Oh my God, we got to come up with something. But it was it was friendly. It was yeah. respectful. It was a friendly competition. Absolutely, we respected yeah. each other and yeah. what they were and probably doing. enjoyed their music too. Of course. I did enjoy their music. Yeah. I thought their music sounded better, but that we wrote better songs. Okay, that was just my <laughs> philosophy. I know they'll beat me up for it. <laughs> I love Jimmy and Terry, but I, I thought they had a sound that was just so pristine, the way it sounded and a warmth to it. There was, but there was a warmth to what you guys did too. Yeah, so. yeah. And, but don't get me wrong. Now, yeah, they wrote great songs that I love. Yeah. So, oh yeah, one hundred percent. You know, but uh, I, I love yeah. what they did, and I love what Teddy did because yeah. what he was doing was hitting so hard. It's like Jesus Christ, oh, yeah. where did he get those sounds from? You know, yeah. my prerogative and some of the stuff he did. Absolutely. But we all mm-hmm. respected each other's work, mm-hmm. and everybody was working hard. You know, every we didn't rest on. Oh, okay, we've done this, so we can chill. It was like, no, let's on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Let's see if we can outdo what we just did. And I, I love the work ethic, and I try to carry that work ethic into everything, everything in my solo career mm-hmm. as, as well. You know. Talk to me about going from writing songs to the production side of it. Right. Mm-hmm. Going back to what you were just talking about back in the day when you started doing all this stuff with um, L.A. and Face and all that. Mm-hmm. I know you initially kind of hesitated, right, on the production. Like I, I didn't want to be a producer. You didn't want to be a no, producer. I, I love writing the songs, sitting on the couch, yeah. watching them produce it and put it together. And uh, I'll never forget the night that they said... I was back on the couch. Yeah, I, I think we were at Studio Masters, maybe on Beverly. Mm. And... Uh, they said, you know what? He said, you need to finish Superwoman because we got to go over here and do, I forget, I don't even know what they were doing. I'm like, they said, you've been sitting on the couch all this time. said, you know how to do this shit. It was like, finish the ad libs with Karen. Sure. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? You know, and you they were nervous. Left. I was nervous. And they walked out yeah. the door. Yeah. And I got up there with John Gass, our engineer. He says, man, you know what to do? And I just said, okay, roll it. And from the vamp out, you know, and Karen was great as well and helped me mm-hmm. a lot. And uh, so that was my beginning of being a producer. But I had no interest in being a producer. I just wanted to write songs, man. I just wanted to be a songwriter. And then after that, oh, they sent me, they threw me in the fire. I worked with the boys, worked with Paula, you yeah. know, Bobby by myself. Say, hey, man, go down here and do this. Go do that. I'm like, okay. And I figured it out. You know, I said, okay, what would they do? Mm. What would they do? What would Kenny say? You know what I'm saying? Kenny would say, it's not good enough. Okay, let me go one more time, one more time. And I would take it and take it to them and they would go, okay, cool, you're close, but uh, you know, I need a little bit more ad-libs in here. This is a little too crowded. And I was like, okay, and I'd go back, you know what I mean? And just kind of follow their instruction and you know, I figured out what to do. The rest is history. <laughs> the rest is history, as they say. So I kind of figured it out. And, I, and, I, and I'm glad that they pushed me because things would have been a lot different for me. Mm after kind of leaving the face and going on my own. If I hadn't had that experience, I still was nervous, but I, I felt like I had learned from them how to make good records. And I just said, I'm just gonna take what I learned and apply it to what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, and I, Sometimes and I was okay. Sometimes you have to jump into that fire. You have to jump into that and fire. Just, and just get. Yeah. yeah, and years later I got confirmation from them mm-hmm. uh, on work that I did with Drew Hill. And you yes. know, they both, complimented me on, you know, how good the, the, the work was. And that made me feel really good. I said, hey, man, I just tried to make you guys proud and, you know, keep it going. And, they, you know, so it was good. It was a good learning ground, mm-hmm. probably the best that I could sure. have gotten. Yeah, We're going to get into Drew Hill later, but yeah. I want to, I want to, there, and by the way, there's so many songs, we're not going to be able to cover them <laughs> today. So I'm going to be touching <laughs> on a few. Two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I'm going to be touching on some today, but there's just no way we could cover everything. We'd be here all day covering all these songs. Mm-hmm. So there's too many incredible, uh, incredible songs here. But anyway, uh, going on here, you're talking a little bit about Karen White. So I want to have you talk about Superwoman because this is just, 
one of those songs it's timeless like many of these songs that yeah. we're talking about timeless songs mm -hmm. right so yeah what do you remember about writing superwoman either writing what inspired it how it all um, came to be you know kenny's always of course kenny's always the the lead you mm -hmm. know he's batman i'm robin it's like sure. hey what you got hey i got this idea i'm thinking you know let me let you check it out yeah. and i'll sit there like i sit and he'll go through it like oh, man so that can be really powerful and i'll, I'll never forget kenny said I want it to be like an anthem. And I said, okay, I got you. Cause he would lay it out. You know, he would lay it out and I would try to follow and try to help him get to what his vision was, you know, and kind of get on that same channel mm. and tune into where he was. And once we were still in the apartment on Highland in Los Angeles, and it just kind of came, the story just, and we, we would kind of be laughing. Okay. Yeah. The dude is kind of, you know, he's kind of mean, he doesn't really talk to her, he just comes in from work and, you know, where's my food? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, he's that kind of guy. And she's all timid and, you know, here you go, baby, here's mm -hmm. your dinner. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it was just kind of, we would always kind of try to visualize it, what kind of people they were and uh, worked on it all day. And it just kind of one of those that just, once it started, you knew it wasn't like a have to come back to it. I remember saying, damn, this is like really a special song really big song to me. Because a lot of times people don't understand the best songs aren't necessarily the first songs that come out. Sure. The first songs that come out are the songs that need to come out first. Okay, this needs to come out first, knock the door down. It's kind of a time period. But then what follows it to me are the better records most of the time to me. You know, like I always thought Love Saw It was a great song. Mm -hmm. To me, it's one of my mm -hmm. favorite songs. It wasn't a hit. Sure. It was an okay song, but to me, it was a great song. Mm -hmm. But in the public eye, you know, it didn't do what, you know, the way you love me or Superwoman did. But I thought Love Saw It was a great duet with Kenny and, 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 and Karen, you know. Mm. But uh, Superwoman was a, and when it came, it was big. Yes. It was a big record, you know. And I, it's, it's one of those records when I hear today for several reasons, because it was kind of like my first producing <laughs> in the vamp and the yeah. ad libs with Karen. And the other thing was just a, it was just a really great, great record. You know, Karen, Karen sang that, and Karen yeah. sang the hell out of it. She did. She brought it. She brought it. She really did. Yeah, yeah she brought she it. Really she put did. her foot into that one. So yeah. Good so record. It, it really is. It really is still today. Um, Bobby Brown, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Bobby a few years ago. Great. <laughs> my man. He's great, great, I love great that guy. guy. Bobby Brown, I love that so, guy. So, <laughs> 89, Yeah. I want to talk about specifically Rock With You. Okay. This is a great song. So it's you, Face, and L.A., yep. right? Mm -hmm. Tell me about this one. This is just a, another humdinger. Uh, you know? Bobby, I was at Silver Lake working. Either we were working, I think we were working with Karen. Um, you probably have a better timeline of when their records came out. And so this, this kid, Bobby Brown, got kicked out of the new edition. He's going to come by and meet you guys. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he, the dude busts in the door, Yeah, 21 years old, on level 10, Balls out. He's ready to go. He's ready to go. <laughs> and so, you know, we talked to him, whatever, in L.A. And we're talking to him. He goes, sure. okay, today's my birthday, so, you know, I'll get with y'all. He goes out the door, and I said, that kid will never live to see 30. I said, wow. he will not make it to 30. That's what I saw. That's what you saw. Kenny saw the energy. Yeah. That's what Kenny saw. He goes, <laughs> I'm going to bottle that up right there. That's Kenny. He sees the he sees what you don't see. That's sure. why, to me, he's so amazing. Sure. And he's like, no, no, no. Let me, let me, what I see is, you know. So, mm. uh, so Don't Be Cruel was, that just was written for Bobby. That yeah. was, <laughs> nobody could have done that song but Bobby. Sure. It just was aggressive. It was mean. It was oh, Bobby. Yeah. It was Bobby. And uh, so then Rock With You, mm. actually, I had some lyrics that I had written on a napkin in Kenny's apartment. Sure. And um, he goes, what's this? I said, it's just some lyrics I wrote down. I said, I loved Freddie Jackson's Rock Me Tonight. Oh yeah, yeah, that's and great. And I go, but yeah. damn, it would, be, it would be so much better if it was, I wanna rock with you. You know, that was kind of like my yeah, concept. Yeah. And Kenny goes, oh, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. Kenny does what Kenny does and formulates the track and we sit there and, you know, massage it and put it together. And that's pretty much how it, Kind of came together. It was to me. It's a great song. When I hear it, that really record, is. it's one. What's one of those records? It's like rock with you. Can we talk? My my my. Yeah. It's something about the sound and the time period that just 
when you hear it, you go, yeah, dang, I remember this. Yeah, you know, great record. And Bobby, of course, brought it and great put delivery. his foot in it. Great delivery. Yeah. And I tell people, I said, Bobby Brown was not a great singer by any stretch. Mm. What he was great at was his energy and his confidence. You couldn't tell him that he wasn't great. Yeah. And you know, if you even watch the video of him, you think he's this greatest singer, but some of the notes a little the sharp, yep, a little sharp, yeah, a little sharp, a little flat. Yeah. Like, yeah, but the emotion of it. Oh, he's cool. He's cool. Mm -hmm. Let's not mess with mm -hmm. it. And that's what we got from Bobby was the confidence yeah. and that energy that mm -hmm. Kenny saw yeah. that Bobby put into it. It's like, man, you can't you can't mess with that. That's yeah. not perfect, but you know what? It's it, it's good. It's yeah. really good. And his emotion on those records, uh, every little step, rock with you, don't be cruel, even Teddy's my prerogative. Oh, yeah. Just amazing performances by Bobby, yeah. you know, and yeah. following them up with, you know, with them, with the videos that were yeah. so a big part of what mm -hmm. we did back then, mm -hmm. taking it to another level. For uh, sure. Then Roni, that Kenny great had song. written. Great, great song. song that Kenny wrote. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was a combination of those songs and then Bobby, putting Bobby in them. And yeah. a lot of times, one is just as important. You know what I mean? It's the full package. It's the it's full like, package. It's yeah. just like those early Tony Braxton songs were songs that were fit for her. For her. You know what I'm saying? They were tailor-made. Tailor-made. Yeah. But then she brought what she has to make it even greater. And as producers, that's what we're looking for. Yeah, this is the way we sing it, but you take it to the next level. To the next level, put yourself in it yeah. and give me something else that I didn't hear. Sure. And that's what I love as a producer, giving me something that I didn't hear or that Kenny didn't do on the demo. I was like, oh man, shit, now it's even better. Okay, I can take that yeah. idea and I can expound on your idea mm -hmm. and make it even better. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Rock With You is, I think it's, even Don't Be Cruel was really big. To me, Rock With You is like a signature song to me. It is. Uh, yeah. Of Bobby's, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, great For song. Sure. Fun, fun So you, you talked a little bit about My, My, My. That was actually my next question. So mm -hmm. this one, I mean, Johnny's great, great singer. Yep. I mean, yep. what was this being in the studio? I mean, just he's in the booth. You guys are doing what you're doing. What, what, paint the picture for us on this one. Uh, actually, it was one of the tougher production uh, sessions. sessions for me. Really? Yeah. Johnny was very difficult. Johnny's a live singer. And even in that session, Johnny said, I hate recording because it restricted him. Mm -hmm. You know, and me and him battled. L.A. had sent me and Kale. One of the guys that was in the deal, he and I were a production team early on. Yeah. And he had sent Kale and I down to do the vocals on My, My, My. And man, we fought with Johnny because Johnny wants to step into the song right from the beginning, give you everything. And I'm like, Johnny, you can't do that, man. You know, we got to start here, take it here, then we'll take it out. And we battled and we battled. <laughs> That's what I remember. It was just, and he does not like recording because it restricts him. Mm. You know, I mean, he's alive and he improvises and he's great. I said, but Johnny, we've got to make a record. There's a difference between making a record and singing it live. You For know, you sure. can't come in. So this is what I described to Johnny. And I do this with singers mm. and Johnny Gill's responsible for this. I said, hey, mm -hmm. when the girl walks in the room, I don't want to pounce on her. Let her come in with her negligee on, take a little bit of this off. Then she takes something else off. Mm. You know what I mean? But you don't pounce on the girl since she comes in the room. Of course. We gotta get there. Let's build up to it. Yeah. And so I use that with other singers to describe starting the song, taking it to this level. Now we're gonna take it home. You know what I'm saying? In other words, you gotta have a beginning, a middle. Yeah, you gotta have a build up. Yeah. You gotta for build sure. up. Foreplay, yep. a little bit of middle, exactly. then you climax yep. it to the end. Whoa. And so That's how it goes. That's how it goes. <laughs> you know, you yep. to think it was it was a very hard session. You know, it was it was very hard to work with Johnny during that time to try to get him to start softly and mm -hmm. build. But it ended up being what it is. What it is, a great record. And I yeah. think his biggest record. I think. Sure. I don't know uh, the facts, but I think it's probably be his signature song. Yeah. And it was actually written about a girl who lived in the apartment complex that really we, we would see this girl. Hmm. And from the front, she was like a four. But from the back, <laughs> She's like a 10. <laughs> and we would see this girl, <laughs> Kenny and I would see this girl, never knew her name, never met her. And we'd be like, there she go, there she go. Yeah, yeah. Mm, mm, mm. My, my, my. Woo. That was our saying. <laughs> so we're sitting there, Kenny had just got this Jaguar. 
because he was making a little money from Slow Jam, whatever. So he had this jack while we're sitting in the garage yeah. and he's got the track and she gets out of the car. She would smile, never knew her name, never introduced ourselves and wrote the lyrics in the car about that girl. I love it. And that's how Miles my, 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 the phrase, mm, 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 my, 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 yeah. get that, you know, and that's what Kenny said not long ago. I just think that girl has no idea that that's, that record was written wow. about her. Yeah. Never knew her name, but that's You're out there. Thank you. you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, so, we really appreciate that. <laughs> Great song, though. I love my Speaking mom. of signature songs, Boys to Men, End of the Road. This one's a Grammy, right? Yes, sir. Um, paint the picture for me. Take me back to this session. You got some incredible singers here, right? And Boys oh, to yeah. Men. The best. Bad boys. So tell me, tell me about these guys, working with these guys and, and producing and writing this. How, how did this all kind of come together? Uh, well, you know, End of the Road did not come from their album. It came from the Boomerang soundtrack. It's not a Boys to Men album. Yeah. It was uh, Boomerang. And it was the final song. You have a final song to be recorded mm -hmm. for the soundtrack. Yeah. And so we get up that morning. Kenny goes, gotta have a song. I'm like, okay. He and I go down to, well, we have a little house called the Buckhead House. Yeah. And we had this little house. We had music equipment in it. But Kenny lived at Park Place where Elton lived. Okay. High rise. But when he was working, they complained about the music. So we got this little house on this little street in Buckhead and called it the Buckhead House. We put some equipment in it, put a refrigerator in it. And, and that's where you did all the loud stuff, yeah. Yeah, and had this little Got hockey it. game. There's nothing else to it. Just like yeah. I said, called it the Buckhead House. So we get up that morning, it's raining, go down, because Kenny and I like to work early. Sure. And, well, I got an idea. Okay. I sit in the chair like I do. Yeah. I go, okay. It's got to be big. You know, it's boys to men. I'm going, yeah, that's true. And, you know, our normal thing, and Kenny comes up with a melody and... Okay. Damn, sound like something happened. What happened? I'm like, I don't know, but something happened bad. That's the mood. We're getting in that mood of what happened. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think at the time Kenny had gone through a divorce. Yeah. I was I thought I was going through a divorce. So I think we kind of poured that the experience. Experience yeah. and emotion mm -hmm. into that and worked on it all day. All day. Stayed down there all day. You know, we take a break, get something to eat, take a break, play the little hockey game. Okay, let's go back and listen to it. It's like, damn. So I think Elliot called or something. Kenny goes, yeah, we got to smash. Yeah. He goes, okay, I'll be there this evening. Let's check it out. And so LA comes in. Yeah. He's got a suit on. Typical LA. <laughs> All right, let me hit this motherfucking smash I got. <laughs> Sits back on the couch <laughs> like this. All right, play it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And Kenny hits play. Yeah. All right, that's a smash. That's a smash. You're right. Kenny goes, only one thing. Yeah. But that goes, what? He goes, I want to keep it. I can't give it to him. And we were like, what the fuck? What? He goes, yeah, I got to yeah. keep it. I can't give it to him. It's like, damn, it's the only song we got. This is the last <laughs> song. What do you mean you got to keep it? Sure. And so Kenny said, well, let me record it. Mm. I was like, okay. Go down to the studio. And I think Kenny sang a verse and a hook. He goes, okay, they can have it. It doesn't work for me. I was like, God. Because yeah. we knew it would be bigger. Kenny would have done a great job. Yeah. It was Boyz II Men and they were on fire. We yeah. knew it would be so much bigger. Yeah. And so we, we go to Philadelphia to record. Mm -hmm. It was the only day to record. They were rehearsing for a tour. So that was recorded in Philly. Oh, yeah. We packed was up. Was that a Sigma sound or no? I couldn't tell you. you know, I had to look at the credits and see, but I do not remember. Gotcha. Uh, but it was they were, they were leaving the next day. Okay. And we fly up to Philadelphia to get the vocals on it. And we get there, and I think uh, Nate says, well, Andre can't sing. I was like, what do you mean he can't sing? He's lost his voice. I mean, we've been rehearsing. He, he doesn't have no voice. Mm -hmm. Kenny, I'm like, well, he's got to sing. This is the only time we got to, we got to get this vocal. We, yeah. got to, we got to get this thing turned in. So Wanya says, well, the only way I can sing it is if I sing as loud as I can, but I got to stand in the back of the room. And they were like, OK, get your ass to the back of the room. And then he stood in the corner like that and took a mic. Yeah. And uh, and I felt so bad for him because you could hear it. It was raw. It was really raw. And he stood there and he had a warm towel on his throat. Really? He was rocking like this. And I don't remember him singing it a lot, mm. maybe two or three passes. But I tell people, and you'll, you'll notice this now, 
at the end of the record, he says, oh, my God, help me out a little bit, baby. And the ad libs. Yeah. I mean, the hairs on my arms stood up. I'm like, Jesus Christ. I said, that was so emotional because his throat and I just I picture him. That's how he was. He felt it. Oh, and he was standing there with this towel around his throat. So now we listen to the record and you hear that ad lib. Yeah. That's what was going on. Wow. I said, Jesus, I gotta keep that. I said, man, that shit was like, even when I hear it today, I can be in the car and it gets to that part and I go, I see Wanye, you know, back in the corner with this towel and, you know, he's singing and the ad libs, you can hear that rasp because his voice was gone and we were like making this dude sing. Yeah. And you feel bad, but you're kind of like, damn, it's so emotional. Yeah. And it was, he, he, he put the emotion and he mm -hmm. put his foot all in that. And I think because he knew he didn't have much of a voice, sure. I got to really sing this and get this done because I ain't gonna sing this too many times. And it all just kind of, well, it all just kind of came together, man. It was, it was a phenomenon. When that thing came out, I mean, I, I, I would hear people say, I'm so tired of hearing that record. <laughs> and I was like, thank you. <laughs> Can you, you know? tell me when that won the Grammy though, for you, what, what was that like? What was that moment like when that won the uh, Grammy? It was really, really cool. I actually didn't believe it because we had been nominated before. Yeah. You know, I think Don't Be Cruel was nominated. Superwoman mm -hmm. was nominated. I think My, 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 still around here. Sure. Yeah, the nominations. And it's like, mm -hmm. we never would win. So actually that particular award was a pre-telecast award. It wasn't an award that was on TV. It was mm -hmm. one that they do before. And we walked into the Grammys and Gemma Corfield, who was at Virgin, yeah. uh, we had a relationship with her because After Seven was on Virgin. She said, you guys won. You guys won best R&B song. And I'm like, the fuck out of here. I ain't got nothing in my hand. Nobody contacted me. Nobody came down the aisle and said, hey. You know, so we sat down in the seat and sure. And I think they announced it saying, you know, awards given earlier today. And I just sat there and I go, no, we got in the car. And I said, that is crazy. I, I, I really didn't really believe it. And the Grammy showed up in the mail, in a box. Wow. That was it. And you know, uh, I mean, you know. That had to be a proud moment for you. It was, I was very proud. I was happy. Yeah. And uh, cause we, you know, and you don't work for that, but you do like to get acknowledged for your work, especially yeah. as a songwriter. Cause that's all I get. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I get my little credit and you know, and so, uh, but yeah, that was that was great to this day. I'm still proud of, I, I, I love sports. So I always say, if you were a champion once, you're always a champion. You know what I mean? Like ex fighters, sure. when you sing, you go, what's up champ? If you see That's Buster right. Douglas, you say, what's up champ? You see Mike Tyson, you go, what's up champ? Because they were the champ at one time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you want a Super Bowl ring, you were a champion. You, you did it at the highest level. So very proud of that. And even the nominations that didn't win, I'm still proud that it got acknowledged to get to that point of being for acknowledged sure. for, you know, good work. Mm -hmm. Because we don't write for that. We don't write for that reason. Sure. We write because we love writing and we love music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kenny has done so well. I think I live vicariously through him. So when he was winning, it's like we were winning. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes, so, absolutely. Because, uh, you absolutely. know, artists win more awards than songwriters. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and Kenny's done very well. And I'm really proud of, you know, kind of represents me as well, you know, being along that journey. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so yeah, I'm good. People think I got like 15, 20, it's like, no, <laughs> I don't. The artists that we work and wrote for have a lot of Grammys that yeah. the songs that we, that we were responsible mm -hmm. for. So yeah, good moment, proud of it. Yeah. You were talking a little bit about this one before. Again, another signature song, 1993, Tevin Campbell's Can We Talk? So you, you were describing a little bit about how, how that all kind of came together. Take me back, though, to Tevin's in the studio. This guy's got a voice that... Oh, yeah. I mean, and we're going to talk today about, you know, we're going to talk about Tony in a couple minutes, but mm -hmm. this is a voice that you, you have crazy. heard a voice like this before. Yeah, I mean, crazy. He actually, when he got to Los Angeles... Yeah. His mother and somebody brought him by the studio. We were working on something. I think we we're probably working on After Seven. Yeah. And she came in and, um, yeah, they said, this little kid wants to sing for you guys. And he came in. I don't know how old he was then. He had to be really, I don't know, really young. And he came in and he sang Karen White's part. He sang, okay, sing Babyface's part. He sang Kenny's part. Like, yeah, this dude can sing. And, you know, sometime later we hear that, you know, Quincy had signed him and, you know, Prince was doing some stuff on him, which yeah. was really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I get a call from Kenny. You know, I'm back, I'm in Atlanta, Kenny's in Los Angeles. He says, hey, yeah. uh, 
I used to work with this kid, Ted. Remember Ted? And I go, yeah, I remember. He could sing his ass off. He goes, yeah, I'm going to write some songs for him. I want you to come out and we'll put some stuff together. I'm like, okay. Get on the plane. And the usual, you know, he goes, here's what I got. I sit in the chair. Yeah. And he plays um, Ready or Not, which was an old song that Melvin, his brother, had demoed back in Cincinnati. I don't know why after seven to this day didn't record Ready or Not. Not Ready or Not, but uh, I'm Ready. Okay, I'm Ready. Tevin, yeah, Tevin did. Yeah. The album's called I'm Ready. Yeah. Great song. I remember when Kenny did it in Cincinnati because Kenny had a great demo of it. I don't know why after seven. I'm going to ask him when I talk to him. Okay. Why didn't they record I'm yeah. Ready? Because yeah. Melvin's demo was great. Yeah. Anyway, so he played I'm Ready. Mm-hmm. He said, oh, you already heard I'm Ready. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a hit. I like that. Mm-hmm. Then he played Always in My Heart. Great yeah, song. Idea, great song. And he played Can We Talk. I was like, that's a hit. That's it. So that's what I got. We pretty pretty good. You know, the good, good. Oh, yeah, it's great. So we started and we didn't work on uh I'm ready because it was already written. And uh I think we did I think we did Always in My Heart, which I really love. I love the story of Always in My Heart. This and I love the way Tevin sang it. And then Can We Talk? Can We Talk was easy because like I said, it was sort of our own high school experience of being shy yeah. and talking to girls. And I remember mm-hmm. that coming together really quickly. You know, not a long time. It's like, damn, it's kind of quick. Recording it, and Tevin takes it, <laughs> of course, to another to another level. Yeah, I was like, damn, he's singing the hell out of this song, especially when he gets to the bridge. And oh, he just, yeah. I mean, he does what Kenny did, but beyond, you yeah. know, because his range is his so range. High. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, so great. Exactly. Yeah. So we finish it, and Kenny goes, uh, "Quincy's gonna come check it out." I'm like, "Quincy, Quincy, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Quincy's gonna come check." I never met Quincy. Damn, Quincy Jones is coming. So what, tell me about that. What was that? Oh like? my God, this dude. You know, he's like. So the song's done. At this the song's point. done. So he comes in over here. He wants to listen to it. So Kenny's wow. like, Quincy's gonna come down. I'm like, okay. And Quincy comes in and hey, yeah, nah, nah, man, how you doing? How you doing? And I'm just like, this is like the goat of all goats. Of course. You know, and uh, you hit play. Hit play. He hears it once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. smash, man, smash, man. And then he just starts. He just starts talking. Him and Kenny are talking, and he's going from Dinah Washington to Frank Sinatra yeah. to Michael Jackson to Lena Horn to and I'm just, body of work. And I'm just like, like, yeah, I don't think I said one damn thing. <laughs> I, I I was all ears. And Kenny, I think Kenny asked him, "Well, you know, we kind of get nominated, but we don't win. Why is that?" Um, and he told us, "Oh, you know, these Grammy people, they got to see your name." Over and over, you got to stay at it. They got to see your name come up year after year. And I was like, okay, that kind of makes sense. But, you know, anyway, so he kind of, he said he went through that in his career Mm -hmm. where he never would win. And then all of a sudden he started winning. Sure. And uh, so, yeah, it was great to meet him. I wish I could have gotten to talk to him again. I still may at some point, but that was great. I mean, to get his approval, he thought the song was great. And, you know, the song came out. The song was phenomenal. And that's a great moment. That's yeah, it was a great, great moment. moment. And I don't think I ever heard that story. Yeah, that's it great. was nominated for a Grammy, and we lost to Jimmy and Terry for what would they win? That's the way love goes with Janet. And <sighs> and you know you couldn't great song too. Great song too. Yeah, but that, that was, was the first time I wanted to win, where I said I really want to win. Yeah. Other times it was like oh, okay, that's cool, we got nominated, and you keep going to work. But when this nomination came, you wanted to win. I wanted to win. You know, I can admit I wanted to win, and it was up against a great song and great songwriters and they won. And I was like, God damn, you know, it's just, <laughs> but that's one I could say I wanted to win and I was really disappointed. Sure. You know, but great song to this day, that song, the kids that were not, to stay were born. not even born. People send me videos periodically. Oh, of people yeah. singing, can we talk? Somebody sent me All over the world. in a dorm and these kids are singing, can we talk the top of them? Like, these kids weren't even born. You know, but it's one of those songs that just generation generational, yeah, yeah, that mm-hmm. just uh, keeps keeps, keeps going. yeah keeps going. Everybody loves it when it comes on. That is people's record, and it is a good record. I and I love that record. I love it too because of Tevin's performance, but the way Kenny made it sound, the sounds that he used keyboard wise, oh, yeah. I loved the way like the steel drum. Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, yeah. Dun, dun, and the drum programming, the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Is, and and, and like I said, Kenny's yeah. a, he's a master at melody. And it's got it, that's what he would always say. 
Let's make them remember the melody. Yeah, there's like all these different melody parts within yeah. the song. Make yeah, them remember sure. the melody if they don't know the lyrics. You can F up the lyrics, yeah. but you can know the melody. How many times have everybody sings the wrong lyrics, oh, yeah. but we know the melody? Exactly. And that's Kenny's fault. And that's what catches him. Yeah. That's why it's called a hook. Hook yeah, them Exactly. In. And so that's, that's, that's first with Kenny. If he comes up with that melody, mm -hmm. he goes, I know, he said, it's good. It's like, if we just figure out the, the right, we had a track. <laughs> For the longest, this track we knew it was a hit. Yeah. Dun 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 dun. It was the baddest track. We could never write lyrics for it. It's like, damn, we just come up with the right thing. What the hell is it saying? And this track, I don't think we ever took as long as to come up with something for that track, but we knew that melody that yeah. he had played, mm -hmm. it was a hit and ended up being, you know, Secret Rendezvous. Got it. it won't stop, they don't stop. Yeah. I not stop Secret Rendezvous. Da -da -da -dum, da -da -dum. Yeah, it's a great, great song. And it was hanging around for, and we could never, and once we did though, mm -hmm. you know, it was easy to fill in the dots, but uh, melody. Sure. And I, you know, I try to, you know, learn that and, you know, take that. You know what Kenny said, the melody's strong. Is it weak? Is it not memorable? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where a lot of, when I listen to things, they miss a lot yeah. of times. I think a lot of young writers miss the melody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Some sure. are pretty good, but it's the melody that's not, it's not hooking you Not in. hooking me in. Yeah. You know, yeah. almost, but kind of falls short mm -hmm. that we would say it's falling short. And that's what I admire about Kenny. You go, okay, I'll scrap it, write something else. And it'd be good. Don't get me wrong now, it would be good. And after seven, got a lot of those <laughs> ones that he said, you know, they, they got a few of those, which ended up, they made them great. You know, sure. but it worked out the way it was supposed to work. Yeah, after seven was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Still are. Yeah, those dudes are um, awesome. Yes, sir. I want to talk about Toni Braxton. Mm -hmm. You mean the world to me. She's got so many great songs, but let, let's talk about. Probably my, it's been my favorite song. Is that your favorite? Long time. Yeah. Wow because of, once again, the way it sounds. Uh, I don't think we've ever heard a voice like Tony's. I don't either. Yeah. I agree. It's a one of a kind. One, one of, of a kind. kind. Uh, great record. Uh, Kenny told me that it's one of uh, our biggest uh, uh, royalty payers. Is it? Is really? it? You mean more than it, play, it plays a lot, it pays a lot. I was like, really? Goes in. Wow. Because he kind of studies all in the know of that stuff. Sure, sure. But I loved it because of just how she sounded, how she performed it. Uh, ironically, there's a guy that we used on it to play piano named Vance Taylor, who plays Vance with Frankie Taylor. Beverly and Mays. And okay. he was here last night playing on a really? Christmas song for me. Oh, nice. Last night, nice. yep. And, uh, and when he left, he goes, I love and he said, that was cool. He said, that kind of reminded me of the Tony stuff. I go, yeah, kind of did, but he had a sound. Yeah. The grand piano on that record is Vance Taylor. Okay. So, you know, Kenny had this idea. So, well, let's bring somebody to replay what we play because they're real. Because I know you players. use Greg a lot too. Greg Filling Games. On a lot of, yeah. A Kenny lot of songs. Yeah. Because yeah. Kenny and I write from piano, but we're, we don't say we're piano players. Sure. So, you know, Kenny's idea was, hey, let's bring somebody that can. So, Vance played on that. Yeah, Vance played on that. Interesting. And some other records too. So, let's bring somebody in that yeah. can embellish what we have done and make it better. Yeah, sure. And I was like, wow, that's that's a good idea. So he would bring Greg in and mm -hmm. I, I use Vance. And then I worked with Lionel Richie once. Really? And you know, people don't know Lionel Richie is not a piano player. He's a saxophone player. He played saxophone in Commodores and sang. But like Kenny and I, he just wrote from the piano. Yeah. And when I worked with him and we were talking, it was deep. So I'm the same way. He said, I only know a few chords. I go, yeah. me too. So that's why the song <laughs> sounds that's why the song sounds similar, because I only know so much. Yeah. You know, yeah. but people don't know that Lionel is uh, he's a saxophone player in the Commodores. And, Interesting. And he wanted to write, so yeah. he started sitting at the piano. And yeah, of course, we know all the, rest three, is the rest is history. Another and, great uh, one right there. God bless him. Yeah, so uh, Tony, just probably the most special thing to my heart, Yeah, the dearest thing to my heart. I think when she came, she was so innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, we embraced her like a little sister. And, you know, she was a great listener. She was a great um, artist who took direction really, really well. And uh, just took those songs and just 
made them hers. That's all I can say is she made yeah. those songs, Tony Braxton songs. Yeah, you know, sure I'm, that. And I love, there's other songs, but You Mean the World to Me is my favorite Tony Braxton song, mm -hmm. followed by probably another sad love song, Breathe Again, Seven Whole Days. Just her performances. I, I, I always said she was the black Barbara Streisand. I think for me, you're making me high. Might be my favorite. Yeah, yeah, that's a good record. It's a that's great, a good record. She did. Record. Yeah, she did. Yeah. Great, great job on that. But I, I think it was she just. Her voice is the favorite voice that I love to hear coming back. Yeah, the speaker when I work. Yeah, when I work is her voice and Melvin Edmonds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. just something about their texture. Yeah, the tone, tone, tone yeah. phrasing mm -hmm. that you don't tell them. That's not something that we told them something that they had natural just natural mm -hmm. yeah 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 i did a christmas album with it too that i love i did a couple of songs that are one of the songs my favorite song christmas time is here nice with her that i yeah. love when it in christmas time they'll play it and i'll hear it in the mall or something nice God, nice damn that's such a good record you yeah know, just uh a lot of fun i used mm -hmm. a quartet you know because oh, nice. what nice. i was doing wasn't feeling right so i got these four guys a quartet and they played it maybe two yeah. times nice. and uh, i took it out to capitol Records, sure. And I uh, mixed it with a guy. It was a guy. Uh, can't, he we worked with Nat King Cole, older. Oh guy. wow, okay. And I mixed it in the room that, you know, nice. they did all that's cool. Sinatra and Nat King Cole. That's cool. It's that's still, iconic over there. Yeah, iconic. Yeah. So I, yeah, I, that's special to me too, just because of the process that I oh, did. Yeah. It was unusual for me to do what I did. So many iconic yeah. songs and be in that building there. and yeah. see the pictures and you know him telling me the stories. I'm sorry that I, his name's good, but I'll yeah, think of yeah. it. You can insert it in sure, so and give sure. him some props. Yeah, fun. I'm thinking, um, you know, my next question, you've worked with Michael Jackson, Aretha, Whitney. I want to focus on these three for a minute. Mm -hmm. All, some of the best singers of all time. Absolutely. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, right? the best. Absolutely. So do you have a special memory or special thought, like when each one comes to your mind, what's that special memory or just thing that you think mm -hmm. of immediately? When you think uh, of Michael, Aretha, and Whitney. Michael was, we, he was the only, he got us to come to Los Angeles to work. He wouldn't come to Atlanta. Yeah. So Kenny in LA said, okay, we'll give you two weeks. We'd go out to Los Angeles. Cause we had set up shop here by that time. Yeah. And we'd go out there to work with Michael and we're in a studio over here. And then he's got Teddy in another studio. And for the first three days, he doesn't show up. He's like, we're there cranking out songs, whatever, whatever. But, uh, Couple of memories. He comes in the first time. Uh, you know, we're talking. I'm just kind of, you know, sitting there. Ellie and him and Kenny are talking, and mm. I don't know. We got to talking to each other and blah blah blah. And he goes, "You, you two guys are from Indiana. Your sense of humor. You're from you're from Indiana." But yep, we're from Indiana. Just like you, man. Ready to work. Uh, that's one. The other one was one day we go to work. It's actually a few. It's really funny. Yeah. And. He and Macaulay Culkin are just running around the studio like yeah. kids, and we're sitting there like <laughs> this. Oh, fuck. Yeah, you know they're just running around like kids. I said, yeah. "This dude yeah. is really a kid." Yeah, he's really a kid. Yeah, and he ran around and he came in and had some little prank pins and <laughs> no, use my pin, use my pin. Okay, I'll use your pin. <laughs> I got you, I got yeah. you. Okay, now you ready to work? You ready to go to work, Michael? Sure. And, you know, one day he came in and started answering the phone. No, no, it's really me. Who do you want to speak to? Yeah. It's Michael Jackson. It's me. I'm not playing. Yeah. You know, that just, you know, just, it didn't end well, but it was quite the experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they came to us one day. Hey, well, Michael's running late because he's been in a wreck. Yeah. And he's scared to get out of the car. <laughs> I'm going, why is Michael Jackson driving? Right. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, right. Why is he driving? He's been in a wreck. Of yeah. course he's scared to get out of the car. Somebody had to go get him. Yeah. And he pulls into the parking lot in this big old white cranky <laughs> suburban. I'm going, why is Michael Jackson driving this white suburban? And he <laughs> and he pulls in. It's just like so surreal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was an experience. It didn't end well. Sure. Um but Good experience. Great to Good meet memories. him. Good, Good memory. Memories. Uh, the song we actually recorded with him called Slave to the Rhythm. Eventually came out. Eventually came out. He didn't yeah. put it on that album, right. which I was so disappointed. But yeah. years later, uh, they did a posthumous album. Yes. Where is it? 
There? Over there. Yeah, yeah. to the right. Post yeah. them this out and say, hey, I'm gonna, Timbaland's going to go in and fix all these songs that they're going to use yeah. Slave to the Rhythm. I said, okay, that's cool. So and they did a nice job. With did it. a nice job. And yeah. I was, I can say that I did work with Michael, you know, got a little bit of yeah. fruit for it. Sure. So that was cool, cool experience. Uh, Whitney, uh, I didn't work a lot with Whitney. I worked on the Bodyguard yeah. soundtrack. And that was a lot of fun. Whitney had a lot to do with that song. Uh, Queen, Queen of the, the Night. Queen of the Night. Yeah, yeah. because yeah. once... Kevin Costner had a title yeah. called Queen of the Night. And we don't write from titles. So we were kind of like, it was like the Elton Bernie thing. Yeah, we, right. we needed Elton. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What right. you hear, Elton? Yeah. You know, so he gives us his title. It's got to be called Queen of the Night. That's what I remember. Yeah. And I remember us just struggling because, you know, we usually have music. Mm -hmm. And um, long story short, you know, uh, between Whitney and, and Kenny, it came together, you know, and, uh, and I wasn't crazy about it. What made me really fall in love with the song is the way that Kevin used it in the movie, the scene. I was like, oh, I get it. Now I get it. You know, now I really love it because she was a rock star. He was kind of a visionary, Kevin Costner, you know, in terms yeah. of I Will Always Love You, too. I think yeah. he, he went and got that song. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. yeah. So he, he gave it to do his thing. You got to give him some credit. Oh, absolutely. Sure. That's what yeah. I said. So when yeah. I saw it inserted in the movie, I was like, you were like, okay, that makes sense. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was a struggle to get it written. Yeah, you know, but once it came together and you put it with the movie, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I get a great song and Whitney. Yeah. And I just remember, same thing, we were working somewhere, and Whitney and Bobby came in, and I called them Bonnie and Clyde. That was my Bonnie nickname. And, and I said, <laughs> and I looked at them, and they were, I don't know what they were just. <laughs> I'm not gonna say what yeah, they're yeah, doing, but anyway, yeah. I said, I give that shit two weeks, two weeks, <laughs> and that's over. Two weeks, that's over. That ain't gonna work. <laughs> Little did I know. What did yeah. I know? These two sure. dudes were, they were, they were crazy about each other. Sure. We had one session at my, Kenny was actually doing the session yeah, at my yeah. studio mm -hmm. and they were there. I, I was just kind of there. Yeah. Yeah. And they came in late. Whitney comes downstairs and she's sweating. I'm like, why are you sweating? Yeah. I was up there wrestling with Bobby. He thought he could take me, but he can't take me, but he can't take me. You know, I had, I had to put him down, put him down. I'm going, <laughs> okay. And we could hear this bumbling going on yeah, upstairs. Yeah. I guess they were up there wrestling. Bonnie and Clyde, that was my nickname. What a voice. What a oh. voice, Whitney. Yeah, it's, it, I, it, hurts, it hurts to talk about yeah. that story because, yeah. you know, we all know what that is. But. Sure. But anyway, Aretha, who was my favorite, yeah. and uh, never dreamed I'd even be in a room. With That's a Aretha. moment. That's, That's a, a moment. It was, it, was, it was a moment. You'll never yeah. forget that. I won't forget that. That, Elton John, and Michael Jackson. But Aretha is at the top because my mom, as a kid, grew up playing those records. Yeah. On Saturday morning, she's cleaning up. She had on Respect and all those great Aretha records. And she's the queen. She's the top. Oh, yeah. The, That's right. The top. And uh, Kenny and I had written a song called Willing to Forgive. Okay. And went to work with her in Detroit because she didn't fly. Flew to Detroit. That's right. Right. Worked with her. And that was cool. So we did that song. It did really well. And uh, I don't know what, it, I don't know if it was the next album. It had to be a different album. Uh, I had sent a song to Clive yeah. called In the Morning. So they had got this song. I don't, I don't even know if I sent it for Aretha or if Clive reached out, maybe he reached out and I said, okay, here's a song. And said, well, Aretha wants to work with you. She really loves your song. I'm like, Aretha Franklin? Like she wants to work with me? Yeah, yeah, she really likes working with you when you were with Kenny. And so I'm going by myself now. You know, I'm on my own. You're going solo. I'm going solo. Yeah. With Aretha Franklin. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you get nervous. Oh, I'm I'm nervous from the call. Even I was oh, yeah. glad that she liked the song. Fly to Detroit. I'd be nervous too. Yeah, fly to Detroit. Absolutely. And uh, you know, it's like this is Aretha Franklin. What do you tell a person to do? What am I going to tell her to do? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's Aretha Franklin. So she sings. And she sings from 12 o'clock to three o'clock and she takes the headphones off and she goes, okay, that's it. You got it. Okay, Miss Aretha, thank you, I got it. That's Aretha and she knew she had it, you know? That's and, incredible, yeah, that's yeah, incredible. she would come in, she'd eat, she'd sing, take a break, eat. Yeah. And then when she finished, she'd eat at the end. And uh, it's about the story yeah. Let me backtrack your story. My memory is sure. when Kenny and I go to work with her the first time. Okay. So we get there. We get there early. We're always on time. The artist is usually late. No problem. 
hey, Aretha, be here in a little bit, but she made some uh, oxtail stew in there in the kitchen for you. I'm like, oxtail stew? Mm. I'm vegetarian at the time. We go to the kitchen, there's this big old gray beat up pot. It's got all this stuff in it, grease, corn, all kinds of stuff floating. I'm like, I'm not eating that. Kenny goes, you gotta eat it. I'm like, I'm not eating that. He goes, can't you just eat the vegetables? I'm like, it's full of grease. Look at that stuff. The shit's yeah. floating all on the top of the pot. Sure. I said, I'm gonna get a turkey sandwich. So I send out for a turkey sandwich. You know, I'm not eating that. And so Aretha comes in and we go into the control room. Yeah. She puts her hands on her hips. Who ordered a turkey sandwich? when I just cooked this oxtail stew. And I'm like. That is too good. I'm like, that is a me, Miss Aretha. Boy, yeah. do you know how long I worked on that oxtail stew? Like, but I'm bitching too. So that's my Aretha. That's a great story. Like funny. And in turn, yeah. after that, she came to Atlanta. She wanted to fix something. Clyde was, Aretha's gonna be in town. Mm -hmm. She wants to fix one line. Can you go in with her? I go, yeah, Clive, I'll go in with her. So the tour bus rolls up. And at the time, I knew she was coming, so I had my mom and dad cook some food for her. Yeah. Because my dad's a master in barbecue. Oh, really? My uh -huh. mom is great with all the other stuff. Sure. And so we go in, and my mom and dad bring all the food to the studio, and um, Aretha eats, and you know she gets on the tour bus, and she calls, she says, your mama can burn this macaroni and cheese. I said, okay, glad you loved it. I have a picture of that right there. You nice, can look at nice. Her, my dad's ribs. Oh, nice. So nice. that fall, the Grammys come. Mm -hmm. Grammys come on. I'm not watching. I'm working. You know, whatever. Yeah. I'm not nominated for anything. My phone starts blowing up. Fucking phone blowing up. Aretha just mentioned your mom on the Grammys. I'm like, <laughs> what? What are y'all talking about? Yeah, yeah. Aretha Franklin mentioned your mom's cooking on the Grammys. So somebody sends me a video excerpt and she's talking, she's giving thanks to these people. And I want to thank Daryl Simmons' mom for her fantastic macaroni and cheese. Are you serious? And my mom was famous for like great. 15 minutes. Wow. And uh, so that's my Aretha Franklin. That's amazing. But we became friends. Uh, she's very funny, you know, love her to death. You yeah. know, went to her service. God rest her Sat soul. there for the whole thing. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just never, just one of those things I never dreamed that Wow. I would meet a person of course, like that, of course. be in a room, mm. but then become friends where she would call me or, you know. Uh, That's nice. But uh, probably the greatest relationship that I made in my music career. And I work with a lot of great people. Oh, yeah. But the Aretha connection was just something that, you know. Special. Special. Yeah. Out of this world would have never, you know, <laughs> imagined that, you know. Uh, because of just who she was, like you said, she's yeah. she's the queen. Yeah, you know. That's right. And uh, so yeah, uh, that was probably my most special relationship. And that's what I loved about being a producer. Even like me and Elton worked a couple of times, but the songs weren't hits. But we became friends. Yeah. You know, Daryl, tacos at my house, nine o'clock. Don't be late. Yeah. Okay, Elton. <laughs> see you later. Daryl, I need to get into the studio. Can you get me in there? Okay, Elton. I'll kick somebody out. No problem. <laughs> Daryl. Dinner at Chops. Don't be late. Okay, Elton. You know, yeah. we became friends with the music. Eh, didn't write a hit, but yeah. became friends, sang with me and Lionel. We sat there and talked, wrote a song. It was okay, but mm. you, you build relationships with people. And yeah. those are life-lasting. So when you run into them, hey, you know, how you doing? It's not about the music. It's about, you know, the relationships that you yeah. have with people. Because you spend a lot of time with them. That's you spend right. a lot of time, mm -hmm. a lot of hours in there. I mean, I loved it because Elton told the greatest stories. Lionel had great stories. Of course, yeah. Aretha is Aretha. These yeah. people that are have done all these wonderful things. Like, man, I sit here all night and listen, listen to you. We don't have to work on any music, you know? Right. So right. that in itself was like a, a, a blessing to be able to be in the room with people like that and yeah. hear their journey. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the relationships that um, I, I made with people, you know? Uh, along with the career, great. The music was great, but the relationships, you know, you can't you can't take that away. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. so you know, the, we, obviously there were some songs we didn't get to talk about today, and some of those are some of the songs that you wrote with Kenny for Kenny's solo career. Yeah, and songs, yeah. and what I wanted to talk about a couple of different things. Um, 
you know, obviously, uh, I think it was 2015, maybe a little bit after that, he released the Return of the Tender Lover album, which you obviously had a big great, part in. Great, great, great album. Great album. Great album. Great disappointment. Great album. Real quick, was wondering if there's any story on Walking on Air with Elder Barsh. Great song. Great song. Anything, no, anything no, from that? No, just... I don't remember because I wasn't there for the vocal session. Oh, okay, he, he gotcha. did the session with L. Yeah. I just, I was in on most of the writing, you know? Yeah. But, I but a great there. album. Great album. I was I was greatly disappointed. Yeah. Because I I would say I don't think we worked on anything any harder. harder yeah. in our career. And I knew it was successful. I just the songs, standing ovation, walking oh, yeah. on air. Oh my God. It was just Fight for Love. I mean Fight for, just, Oh, yeah, that's a great song. Great song. And we worked on that for so long and great, so hard. Great body of work. Great body of work. Yeah. And it's still a I mean, I have it on my desktop sometime. Mm -hmm. I'll just hit one of the songs and I'll just sit there and go, yeah. And then Kenny worked on the music. I mean, you listen to it and it sounds incredible. Cause he just, I would sit there and he just mm -hmm. would keep, he would keep massaging it and massaging it and then laying vocals and, you know, so just hold on, give me a second, just see where I'm going. And I'm like, Jesus, man, I don't know where you're going, but you got there, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But I don't think, I, me personally, I don't think I worked on anything harder or for a long period of time. Yeah. It's that. And I was so disappointed. I just, to this day, I still don't know. It's yeah. just, that's the, that's music. Yeah. You can feel and also, great about something. For sure. And nothing happened. You can not feel great. Oh, how did that happen? That's I, right. You could never tell me Boys to Men was going to stay at number one 13 weeks. Yeah. No way. It's a great song, but 13 you weeks. You just never know. Hell no. Yeah. No, you don't know. Because you don't know. Once it yeah. goes into the universe, you do this. Exactly. Because you don't know. You have a good feeling about it. Mm-hmm. But you don't know. Mm -mm. You don't know how but to But also in, in recent times, um, you know, we were talking about that album also, Love, Marriage, and Divorce. Great, great album. album. Great album. Not and also the After the Seven. Um, timeless. Timeless. Great album. Both great albums, you know. Probably, uh, that you had a, a, a pretty big Yeah, Love, Marriage, and Divorce worked on that a lot with Tony. Tony had a lot to do with that. We worked yeah. the three of us. It was That was fun. And, you know, people have been starving. You know, Kenny and Tony should, they should make an album. Great album. should make an album. They've never made an album. Yeah. Like, okay, here it is. This is gonna be amazing. And it was amazing. It was amazing, but not amazing results. Right. You know what I mean? And I was like, Roller Coaster? What were some of the other songs? I was like. I love that song, I Wish. That's a great. I Wish? That's a great song. The song Tony wrote. Um, Sweat is a great Sweat. song. Sweat. Um, it was like, and it tanked. The whole thing was great. It tanked like an anchor. And, couldn't believe it. So Kenny and Tony get these dates yeah. to go to South Africa. Hey, come go to South Africa. That's big there. Yeah. Right there on the wall. Yeah. Can't even get a call from Kenny's management, Susan. Hey, they're going to give you guys plaques for look. I'm like, plaques for what? Now, you know, they get things late. Sure. So it's already over in the States. It's like, that album didn't happen. What do you mean plaques? And yeah. the first night, and I think at the time they were singing, I forget what the single was, Tony Sure. Kenny and Tony sing it together. I can't think of uh Hurt You, maybe. Hurt You. Yeah. And they sang that and I was standing down in the pit. Yeah. And these people were pressed against the fence and they sang every lyric. And I'm going, what the hell? So get in the dressing room, Kenny goes, Is that crazy? He goes, yeah. You gotta record that. Tomorrow you have to record that. Sure. And that's what it was over there. Yeah. It, that's the power of music. And you know, they were it was mm -hmm. a platinum or whatever they gave us. And we couldn't believe it, you know? Sure. It's the power of music. You never know. And where it, it goes right. all over the world. I mean, I get a royalty statement, you know, a book like this. Yeah. And some days I'll just flip through it. Sure. Korea, Switzerland. Oh, yeah. Amsterdam. That's got to be interesting to look yeah. through all the data. Oh, it is. I, it's fascinating to me. And to see how the songs were used in movies. Oh, yeah. Video games. You uh, name it. Uh, 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 aerobics class, because they have to get permission. You know, BMI tracks this stuff. Mm. And some days I'll just stand there. It's like, I don't remember that song. I don't know what the hell that song <laughs> is. <laughs> I mean, literally, I couldn't hum it. You yeah. know, it's got my name on it and Kenny's name on it, but I couldn't tell you what, you know, songs that weren't hits. They were sure. just sitting on an album. Sure, sure. But that to me is phenomenal to see where music, because yeah. it goes everywhere. Yeah. It goes everywhere. Every nook and cranny, I got a licensing to sign off on a Queen of the Night they were using it in a video game in Korea. Really? Mm -hmm. They were using the song inside the video game. And, you know, they asked you have to sign it. off on it, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. prove this or that, you know, 
You get the yeah. normal stuff, you know, American Idol, The Boys. Sure. You get those all the movies, time. Movies, yeah. Movies and TV shows. But you get some odd ones from, I think I did one for Boys to Men for a yeah. bank, bank commercial they were doing in Ireland for End of the Road or something. Mm. But it's, music is, is amazing where it goes and it touches people. It's, that's why I love it. It's just, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what it does. You know, where it, it, goes, is, it is, it is amazing. And how far it reaches people. And speaking of amazing, I don't want to forget to bring up Drew Hill because this is a part of your career where you really were getting into these, you know, you were with these guys and getting into some incredible songs. I mean, yeah. let's talk about mm -hmm. In My Bed, Never Make a Promise, We're Not Making Love No More. If you want to touch on on these three, um, again, just some of my favorites too. Yeah, Drew good Hill. album. Uh, know? A guy named Hiram Hicks, who have been around for years, did a lot of stuff with, you know, Michael Bivens and that stuff. And sure. He'd gotten a new group. Goes, call me D. I got this group, Drew Hill. I want you to work with him. And I'm like, okay, you no problem. So he brings him to the studio, and it was almost like how Bobby was. Cisco comes in. This dude is on ten. His energy is just like, <laughs> like you know, crazy and yeah. incredible voice. They sing a little bit. I'm like, mm -hmm. damn. Okay, cool. I'll work with him. The kid's great. And jazz had a great jazz voice. had a group, yeah. Uh, yeah. So go back and start working on songs. I think the first thing I came up with was Never Make a Promise. It was an idea that I had, and I thought they could, you know, do the ballad. And I had a songwriter, a guy under me named Ralph Stacy. Okay. That, you know, I had different writers that wrote, would submit things to me. Sure. Projects. Hey, I'm working on this project. Give me a song, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> Ralph had been working at my studio and, um, you know, it was struggling. And I'd given him some money to help him out, give him a ride here and there. Let him, I gave him a key to the studio. He could come in and work. Mm -hmm. And he comes in one night and, and this dude's in tears. He goes, I pawned my keyboards. And I said, what? Your man had to pawn my keyboards, just had a baby, mm -hmm. ain't got no money. I was like, Ralph, he said, a carpenter never, never sells his tools. He'll never sure, do sure. work. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I had helped him out. I gave him a few thousand dollars before. I said, man, I said, Ralph, give me a song, man. I said, a song can change your life. You got any songs? So, you know, whatever. Yeah, I got a dat, man, with some songs back then. You know, I had a dat. He left the dat. And, you know, I don't listen to music right away. I have to be in the mood, mood to listen to music. Yeah. So I popped his daddy in one day, and I'm going through it mm -hmm. just to see what he's got. And he has this song called In My Bed. Yeah. Said, Damn, that's kind of, that's really a nice song. I really like it. So I called and said, hey, man, you got this song on here called In My Bed. I think if, you know, I kind of, massage it a little bit. I'd like to present it. Oh man, do your thing. Whatever you got, do your thing. Mm -hmm. Long story short, mm -hmm. I, it ends up being really a great song. And Hiram wanted to release Never Make a Promise first. And I said, no, I can't be first. I said, in my bed it has to be first. Interesting. And then Never Make a Promise. He goes, really? I said, just trust me. He said, okay, I'll trust you. And, and you were right? I was right. And yeah. my bed came back, came out and knocked the door down, Yeah. followed it up with Never Make a Promise. And that's pretty much how that came about. And then I get a call from Kenny. He says, hey, I like what you did with Drew Hill, I'm working on Soul Food soundtrack. Why don't you come out and do the vocals with me and work on yeah. whatever, we're not making love no more. And so I forgot. Great song. That great really song. is one, yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah, I love that song. Kenny did a great job. So I went out and did vocals with him like I did on the stuff that I had done because he liked the way I laid it out. I laid it out the same way. And uh, that it's was a great feel, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. We're not making love no more. Oh, yeah. Just it's a great feel. You that's know? Kenny, though. He, he, he yeah. the melody. It's got to feel good. The warmth to the it. The warmth Ooh. to it. Man. I love it. Even when I hear it, it's like he and it does brings it. you back to that. Does you back. Brings you back. You know? You know, so that was a great record. And that was fun working on the Soul Food soundtrack. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's how that that's how those songs, you know, came uh, together. And I think it's, I don't know for a fact, but I think. In my bed, never make a promise, and we're not making love. Yeah, maybe their top songs. Like I said, I don't know the facts. I, mean, I think they're some of their best. I yeah, think it's for some sure. of their best. They had some good ones. They I did. Went, I went back the second album and did another one that I wasn't really proud. Those of. Those are my of. favorites, though. So. You know, yeah. some good, but those are my favorites. Those were really, really, yeah. really good records, and they the guys did a great job. They did. They brought what they do to those records for sure. As well. So for yeah, sure. that was a lot of fun. Great group. Great group. I want to ask you, you know, you've worked on a lot of ballads and of course Kenny is as well. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, what do you think makes a great ballad? Um, Just from your, from your, you know. Uh, uh, number one, melody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, lyrics. And then feeling. The feeling. The feeling. 
it's got to be it, got to be, be heartfelt. You got to be able to feel it. It's got to be heartfelt. Like I said earlier, it's got to be able to hook you in. Yeah. And make you just whatever that is. Kenny would always use a word called universal. He goes, he said, I know what you and I, we feel it and we understand. He goes, we got to make sure that the world feels it and can apply it to their life. And we'll, we'll study those lyrics. It goes, okay, yeah, that's, that's our lyric. What's another lyric that would make it universal that people can apply mm -hmm. to them? So like end of the road could be a breakup of boyfriend, girlfriend, husband and wife, whatever. End of the road, it's the end of the road. You know what I mean? So how can it be universal? We know where we, we come from with it, but how can anybody else apply it and make it their song or make it heartfelt? And that's the thing I love when people say, hey, that's my song, the song you guys wrote, that's about me. Like, okay, cool. But it's about you and probably a million more people, but then job is accomplished because mm -hmm. that's what we want to do. We want you to apply it to your life, yeah. not just our story. And sometimes when I hear songs today or I hear lyrics, nothing in specific, I'd be like, yeah, that's kind of cool, but they kind of wrote that about themselves for themselves. I don't think they were thinking of the universe. Still a good song, but that's just my producer ears nitpicking that yeah. Kenny and I would sit there and nitpick and go, okay, it's clear to us, but I don't know if it would be clear to the world. It's like, okay, well, let's make it clear. And yeah. we would sit there and work on it and, come up with a better lyric or make it, make the story more clear. You know what I mean? But sure. I think that's what makes a great ballad is first it's a melody. Mm -hmm. and, and I would say probably second feeling, because to me, it has to have a good feeling as soon as it starts. You know what I mean? It like, does. There's no better record to me when I hear uh, Ready or Not by After Seven. Great song. When that record comes in, dun, 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 it's just like, dun, 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 and then the chords. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, that right there. You exactly said those yeah. chords. It hooks you. Plays it hooks you. Already yeah. before you hear it. Yeah. And exactly. that's the thing, Kenny said, we got to make them fall in love with it before the singing ever starts. And then when, yeah. when Melvin comes in, I'll give you the sun, oh. the rain, the moon, stars and the mountains. I'll give you the word. It's over. It's, it's over. over. Yeah. You're He's not going to hear nothing else. Here. Yeah. You're not hearing nothing else. Yeah. And that's important. That opening line has mm -hmm. to be. We've written songs and gone back and said, okay, but the opening isn't, it's not the right lyric to open. Yeah. It's not, it's not strong enough. We'll write the second verse will be great. Can we go, okay, we got to make the first verse just as great. Sometimes we'll flip flop it. We'll make sure. the second, the first, and then rewrite yeah. another verse because it's so good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's the setup. You have to make them fall in love with the mood before they hear one damn note. Yeah. As soon as it comes on, you got to make them, oh, I already love this and I haven't even heard anything. Exactly. That's, that's how it's got to be to me. That's, that's the ingredients to me, mm. you know. So when you look back on everything you've done from day one, mm -hmm. what are you most proud of musically when you look back at all the songs, all uh, the experiences? You know what I'm most proud of is that, and not that other people don't work hard, but mm -hmm. that we worked very hard. We worked hard on everything that we did. We didn't cut corners. We didn't do it for money. We worked hard on it. And probably the last thing would be is that there was no auto tune on all those records that we made. We didn't have a bailout. We had to keep working, working that artist, working that singer until we got it right. We didn't there have was no it. instant gratification. There was no instant, right. there was no machine that we could right. push, go, oh, it's cool. We'll just run it through this machine. You know, there's some great music today. I'm not taking anything, but I'm sure. so proud that I know all that blood, sweat went into those records. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of them weren't easy. You know, and I would tell artists, I said, nobody's going to know how long it took you to sing this song. They're not going to know that you sounded bad on Tuesday. All they know is when they hear it for three minutes and 30 seconds, mm -hmm. it sounds great. Yeah. That's what we do in here. This is private. Nobody gets privy to mm -hmm. you hitting a bad note or whatever. That's what my job is to do, is to make you sound great at the end of the day. Do they love the final product? And so to me, I'm most proud that, you know, we worked and we worked those artists and made them get it right, no matter who they were. Okay, it's okay, but, you know, I remember telling Elton John he couldn't have a tape. Yeah. So I was, Darryl, can I have a copy? I go, no, -uh. <laughs> I can't. I go, no, it's not finished. He goes, really? I go, no. And I was like, 
<laughs> but you know, it was my job yeah, yeah. to make it as good as I could make it. And mm -hmm. it wasn't ready. And I was like, no, you can't take it with you because it's not ready. This yeah. is what I do. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm most proud that the work, we, we worked and we worked hard, we worked. And I can tell you that Kenny still works today like he's never had a hit record. Yeah. I sit there sometimes and he'll work on something like he's never had a hit. Sure. I mean, and doesn't have to do this, That's of course, if he didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But he still, if he's going to do it, and I'm the same way. I did a record with Kenny Lattimore early this year. Nice. And uh, if I'm going to do it, I only know one way to do it. You know, that's got to give it your all. Got to give it your all, whether it wins or loses. That's right. Hey, I know I put my effort into it. That's that champion mindset, right? Yep, absolutely. The bar is high. The bar is high. <laughs> the bar is high, and I don't, I don't slip. Yeah. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, if it did okay, well, you know what? I worked on it really hard, and okay. Yeah. You know. Yeah, absolutely. So to close things out, just um, in terms of, do you have anything coming out that people can look forward to? Feel free to share with our audience. Um, um, just anything. Nothing. I did a Christmas album last year. Yeah. Uh, kind of like my finale of my career. I'd never done an album of doing everything myself. You know, sure. I always looked up to Kenny for doing Exhale. He did a great job where he did everything. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wonder if I could do that. Yeah. So I took the Christmas album as my opportunity to, you know, write the songs, produce it. So we're going to re-release that again. You can look that up on all the streaming devices, great, Apple, great. whatever. And I did a song with Kenny Lattimore earlier this year called Never Knew. It's doing really well. And uh, but other than that, uh, not too much. Just uh, okay. I'd like for people to check out the Christmas albums. It's a great body of work. Sure. It'll remind you of some of our old school songs. Uh, some of them, people say, man, that could have been a record that could come out now. Sure. But it's on a Christmas album. It is out now. It is out now. So go listen to so it. So go listen to it. Yeah, you'll love the songs. They're good R&B. Sure. Uh, feeling songs, got good feel, good stories, good mm -hmm. lyrics. Everything isn't all Christmassy. You know, got some really great Christmas things there. So, uh, yeah, check that out. But other than that, man, I'm just, you know, just chilling. Cool. You know, enjoying life. Well, I just want to I want to thank Daryl again and on behalf of all the music lovers all over the world. We want to thank you so thank much you, for all the body of work through hey, the years. Thank you for and, liking uh, the songs and, you know, it's really been the a songs pleasure. over the career. And yeah. Hey, thank you, man. God bless you. Yes, sir. Thank all you. All right, cool.